Wonderland. Hey everybody, how you doing? My name is Aaron Hilliard. You're watching Mushroom Wonderland. I'm the creator of Mushroom Wonderland. I'm also the vice president of the local mycological society. And I've been foraging and identifying mushrooms for over 30 years. And what I do on this channel is mainly identify wild mushrooms. We also talk about other aspects of mushrooms like cultivated mushrooms. Um, but in this particular video, I'm going to be doing a forage in a wild area. So this is a mixed conifer forest in Washington state and I'm walking with my dog Gunner. We're going to go take a walk through these nature trails and look for the mushrooms that are growing trail side to help you identify what you're seeing out there to see if they're edible, deadly, hallucinogenic, what kind of mushrooms we got. You can hear Gunner, he's always in the background messing around and uh, he helps me track down mushrooms and then he likes to step on them if I don't get there first. So come with me on Mushroom Wonderland and if you're new to the channel, make sure to hit that subscribe button and uh, leave a positive comment. And if you get value out of videos like this, give it a thumbs up and it lets me know to keep doing it. We're gonna just take a walk through the woods and look trail side at different mushrooms that you might encounter on your walk and help you to identify what they're called and if they have any possible uses. So thanks for joining. Let's go hit the trails, come on. Another thing to keep in mind about wild mushrooms is that uh, they need moisture and they prefer certain temperatures, usually between 50 and 65 degrees is ultimate for most fungus. Um, anything at 80 degrees or above really going to slow down mushroom growth. So um, that's why spring and fall in the Pacific Northwest are the ideal times to be looking for mushrooms because it's about 55 degrees and it's been raining steadily. The Northwest is definitely known for its moisture and it rains up here a lot. And so some people seem to think that like two days after it rains, mushrooms are going to pop up. And in my experience, um, after a long dry summer, uh, and the rains return in September, it'll often take two or three weeks for the mycelium to really respond and start to produce fruiting bodies. So just because it rained last night doesn't mean that the mushrooms are gonna be popping up today. Temperature and moisture, these are the two factors, along with a, you know, decaying organic matter and or a host tree. These are gonna be the determining things as to whether mushrooms are gonna grow or not. And I think that's one of the things that just has always interested in me in, in mushrooms and has compelled me to learn about mushrooms is they're so mysterious and kind of magical and they just sort of pop up wherever they want to. So there's really an element of like a treasure hunt or an Easter egg hunt for adults, if you will. There's an allure and a mystery about mushrooms that has always intrigued me and it's kind of the thrill of the hunt, you know? So that really makes foraging mushrooms uh, fun to me is kind of the treasure hunting aspect of it. Amanita muscaria. So this is your ever popular Mario mushroom. How pretty. It's got the reddest red of all the mushrooms out here. No wonder it's so iconic. It just really catches your eye. But yeah, these are beautiful. And let me get underneath here to show you. <clears throat> so, good example of one. Beautiful. Right down here, this low part is called the vulva. And it's got this partial veil. It's a yellow thing right by my thumb. And, uh, and the cap has those white spots. That's the leftover remnants of that part. So, um, a lot of people use these as a type of psychotropic drug. They're not psychoactive in the sense that a psilocybe mushroom is. Pretty mushroom, good find. I know a lot of people are probably watching this video and thinking, I don't have the courage to like go out and pick these mushrooms, I'm too afraid. And unfortunately here in Western society, we have a bit of fungophobia or mycophobia, which is the fear of mushrooms. 
We're constantly identifying plants and animals, and mushrooms are no different. You just gotta learn the identifying characteristics. Some of them are edible, some of them are dangerous, um, but there really isn't that many compared to plants. Like, there are so many more poisonous plants out here, but we don't seem to be so scared to go out and pick berries because we know how to identify them. If you learn how to identify mushrooms, they're just as easy to identify as a wild berry. So we got some interesting mushrooms growing trail side right here. I'm gonna pick this mushroom because that's the way you identify mushrooms is you have to be able to pick them. It is not dangerous to touch mushrooms. Just don't uh, chew it up and swallow it and you'll be fine. In fact, you could taste a small part of even the most deadly mushrooms and be okay as long as you don't ingest it. And so this mushroom here is a pretty common looking mushroom. It's got these white speckles all over the cap. So it looks a bit like your Amanita muscaria. And so the way mushroom taxonomy works, you've got the genus Amanita, and then you have the species, and that one would be muscaria. This one is um, Amanita gemata, or the gemmed Amanita. And so this is a really common summer mushroom here. Amanita is a genus of mushrooms that contains the most deadly mushrooms in the world, including all four of the destroying angels, as well as the death cap. It also contains Amanita muscaria and panther caps, which some people use for their psychoactive properties, which I'm really not gonna get into right now. You can watch some of the other videos to learn about those a little bit more. But this one is very closely related to Amanita muscaria, but instead of having that really red cap, and the white spots, this one has this kind of yellowish tan cap and the white spot. And so some of the characteristics of the Amanita gemata is you've got these white speckles and they're actually just remnants of this area right down here, which is called the vulva. And it's kind of like an egg. And then the mushroom bursts out of the egg. And as it grows up, chunks of the top of the shell of the egg are still stuck on top of the cap. Um, you can see these little striations along the edge of the cap. Really what that is, is just the gills um, showing through the top of the cap. And these gills are white. And if you were to take this cap off, lay it down on a piece of paper, it's gonna have uh, white spores. Um, this is also, these gills are considered free. Um, they're not actually connected to the stipe itself. And that one broke off a little bit lower than I would have liked it to show you this example, but you can see where the, the gills stop. So those are called free gills. This right here is the dried up remnants of the annulus or the partial veil. And so there's a, there's a thin membranous um, you know, element that connects the edge of the cap or what's called the margin to the stipe until the spores are mature enough to fall and then that ring falls away exposing these gills to the wind and to the elements so that spores can drop out and inevitably thousands if not millions of spores are falling out of this right now they're just blowing off in the in the wind and they're microscopic mushroom seeds basically it also needs a host tree so this is a mycorrhizal mushroom pretty common one and uh, this should be considered toxic i wouldn't try to eat one of these um, all the relatives of it in most field guides are going to call this a toxic mushroom so I would leave this one by the trail side, but now you know it's in a family, a genus of mushrooms called Amanitas. It's okay to pick mushrooms. It doesn't hurt the mycelium in the ground and it won't stunt new mushrooms from growing. But personally, I don't like all the upturned mushrooms on the side of the trail. So if you're gonna pick a bunch of mushrooms like this to identify them, just give them a nice toss out into the forest so you're not leaving litter all over the trail side. Let's keep moving. So if you're fairly new to mushrooms, there's a couple of fundamentals that you should probably know. There's two main types of mushrooms that are gonna be growing out here, and that is the ectomycorrhizal mushrooms and the saprotrophic mushrooms. So ectomycorrhizal mushrooms use trees like these coniferous trees here in the Pacific Northwest, and they use them as a host. So these trees have a relationship with the mushrooms, and you're not gonna find these mushrooms if there's no host tree. And the other kind of mushroom is saprotrophic mushrooms, which grow on just decaying matter. So um, a dead stump or a log laying down next to the trail, when you see mushrooms growing out of that, that's 90% uh, of the time gonna be saprotrophic, although there are some exceptions to those rules. 
So out of those two main types of mushrooms, the easiest ones to track down to actually go out and seek is gonna be mycorrhizal mushrooms because you just need to look for their trees and then there's a good chance you're gonna find those mushrooms. The saprotrophic mushrooms just kind of pop up wherever they found something they like to eat and so it's really hard to predict where those are. Some examples of those are gonna be agaricus mushrooms like the prince or the agaricus bisporus that you'd find in the grocery store mushroom. These are edible, good edible wild mushrooms, but they're hard to predict. They just kind of pop up wherever they want to. So what we have right here is known as Coltrica perennis or the tiger's eye. The original taxonomy for this mushroom or for the Coltrica perennis is a European taxonomy and it's claimed that they grow worldwide but the chances of this being genetically the same as the one in Europe is pretty slim but they're thought to be ectomycorrhizal mushrooms so it's um, attached to the outside of the roots of some trees around here even though this is like a dead stump so it would kind of suggest that they are saprotrophic but uh but they're the the polypore so it's got these tiny little pores underneath the cap and it's got this really woody leathery kind of texture i guess it's called a tiger's eye because it kind of looks like the eye of a tiger i don't know but uh not edible, not poisonous. You know, this wouldn't hurt you if you were to like make it into a tea or something like that, but I've never heard of it being used for medicinal purposes. Very leathery kind of texture. So not one that you really want to gather for the basket, but a beautiful one to look at and uh, in the tiger's eye because it looks like a tiger looking at you, I guess, even though we don't have tigers in North America. <laughs> So another thing you should definitely know about mushrooms is that they are pretty seasonal. Um, some mushrooms like the oyster mushroom or the agaricus bisporus, these are saprotrophic mushrooms. They don't seem to mind what time of year they grow. They can grow any time of year. But mycorrhizal mushrooms like, for example, chanterelles, um, lobster mushrooms, matsutake mushrooms. These kind of mushrooms grow with their host and they really do seem to have a particular growing season. So those mushrooms are typically in the autumn. Um, morel mushrooms, which are arguably uh, kind of a mixture between saprotrophic and mycorrhizal. There's still a lot of studies about morels going on, but they're always found in forests and uh, kind of around certain trees. Um, and these always grow in the spring. I never find morel mushrooms in the fall so um, th if you're going to look for chanterelles don't go out in the spring although in the middle of summer we typically have a flush of chanterelles come up in july in the pacific northwest and they're definitely one of the favorites for foragers around here and what do we see here i see this familiar kind of orange color and it's even got uh it's even got some rose combing on it so check this out Oh, look at this beautiful Pacific Golden Chanterelle or Cantharellus formosus. And so it's got this, this is called a rose comb mutation. Little gills even growing right on the top of the cap. So it's just a little mutation, uh, but a good mutation. It's fine. It's, there's nothing wrong with that. So these growing out here in the summer, beautiful golden chanterelles. This is one of the most popular and wildly sought after mushrooms that grow wild here really easy to identify because if you look it's got a, what are called veins and these aren't exactly gills so they're uh, we call them veins and they they run down they're not true gills so they're not like slits of paper like on the bottom underside of some mushrooms these ones run to current so it means they kind of fade into the stem they don't stop at a perfect line they just keep running down the stem going downward kind of a tapered base. Most of these chanterelles are that way. Oh, here's another one. You know, I find a couple more like this. It's gonna make a good little side dish to a dinner or something. I'm gonna hook up my wife or my mom. Personally, I can't eat these. They upset my stomach. So, although they're considered edible and most people can eat them just fine. Whenever I eat them, I get a really upset stomach and I'm on the toilet. So, uh, whenever you try a new mushroom, try just a little bit at first. Make sure that they, uh, that they agree with you 
before you eat a whole bunch of them. So I'll just make this abundantly clear right now. There is no way by looking at a mushroom to tell if it's edible or not. If you look at a mushroom and you go, man, that looks really delicious. That is an absolute terrible idea. Some of the most delicious looking mushrooms like Amanita phalloides or the death cap. Uh, it's white, it's got white gills. It's got kind of an opaque kind of olive color, but it's really meaty and thick. It smells really good. It just looks like a mushroom that would be delicious to eat, although it's super deadly. So um, there's no way to look at a mushroom and identify whether it's edible or not. You're just gonna have to use well, it's already been discovered by some poor souls, I imagine, back in the past who tried these mushrooms and either got sick or died. And people die every year eating mushrooms that they think are edible or that look edible to them. So do not trust the looks of a mushroom. Very bad idea. Some of the most delicious looking mushrooms are the most deadly ones. So this right here is a good example of um, wild things that could be uh, potentially edible or poisonous and you don't really think twice about it. Most people in this area would know that this is the red huckleberry. It's this kind of medium sized shrub and it grows these red berries right here. And uh, they're good for eating, you know, they're a little bit tart. But growing here right next to it is a foxglove, which is one of the nightshade family and a, and a very poisonous plant. This is actually deadly poisonous growing right next to these berries. Now, people don't freak out so much because for the most part, people know these plants. They've learned to identify them. So we know don't eat these flowers. They're gonna make you very sick, but go ahead and eat these berries because they're really tasty. So this is an example of nature, everyday nature around us that uh, we're not completely paranoid about these foxglove plants because we know what they are. So if more people spent time learning mushrooms, learning dangerous mushrooms, and learning the edible ones, they would feel a lot more comfortable going out. When you first start to identify mushrooms, it seems like a daunting task, like maybe they all look the same. But the more mushrooms you look at, and the closer you look, and you learn the little identifying characteristics, you learn the different parts of the mushroom, the more distinct they become. And eventually you go, how could I have ever thought this mushroom looked like this other mushroom? Because they have such different characteristics. Um, so keep learning, your brain will develop new pathways and learning to identify them will um, happen for you. It's, it's usually slowly, slowly, and then suddenly you'll uh, be able to identify and memorize tons of wild mushrooms. That's my experience anyway. So don't give up, keep trying to learn one mushroom at a time and, uh, and, and you'll get to being a pretty experienced mushroom forager. Contrary to what most people think, there really aren't very many deadly mushrooms here in the Pacific Northwest. There's probably four or five that could actually kill you. Uh, most of the ones deemed poisonous are just gonna give you really bad gastrointestinal upset. So those are considered toxins that really upset your belly. But as far as like deadly, deadly mushrooms, there just really aren't that many that grow here. Another thing that you might not know about mushrooms is um, that they are really high in nutritional value. So all my life I was kind of told that mushrooms just have no significant um, nutritional value, kind of like corn on the cob or something like that, but that's not true. Um, mushrooms contain a lot of protein, some of them more than others. Some of them contain a lot of vitamins, like chicken of the woods is a really good source of vitamin C. If you got lost in the forest, you could really sustain yourself on some mushrooms. Some of them have really high protein. Um, some of them have a lot of fat in them. Some of them have a lot of vitamins in them. Um, mushrooms like that can really help sustain you in a survival situation when you're just looking at all these green plants and woody trees, and then you see a fleshy, meaty mushroom growing in the woods. It's like, 
whoa, it's a godsend. So you really wanna know if that's gonna hurt you or not, or can you cook that up and eat it? That being said, all mushrooms need to be cooked before you eat them. Don't eat any mushrooms raw. Um, that includes the grocery store button mushrooms. I know your aunt probably put them in the green dinner salad raw, but um, your body really can't break it down or metabolize it. And if you ate any abundance of mushrooms, any, uh, you know, a larger amount of any kind of mushroom without cooking them, you're going to get gastrointestinal distress. So even these mushrooms that we talk about being edible, uh, you got to cook them one because there's a chitin layer around the cell wall. Um, which will prevent you from getting any nutritional value until it's cooked. It easily breaks down when it cooks, but, uh, but it's just not good raw. It's like the exoskeleton of a lobster or a crab uh, has the same thing in it, chitin. You can't derive any nutritional value until that chitin breaks down. And some mushrooms just aren't for everyone. Like for me personally, the golden chanterelle, I always loved them. They're a delicious wild edible that grows in the fall. But um, over the past few years, I've developed an allergy. So now I get really bad GI upset if I eat a chanterelle, even, a, even as much as one cooked tablespoon. I've even cooked them for like 10 minutes, hoping that would solve that problem, but it really didn't. So eat a little bit of each mushroom as you find them first before you like gorge yourself on these wild mushrooms. Cause even if they're edible, um, by all the uh, all the field guides and stuff like that. They still might not agree with your belly Hey everybody, so I want to say thanks a lot for joining another episode of mushroom wonderland Please hit that subscribe button if you're new to the channel and uh, we're gonna be doing forays like this every month All throughout the year to see what wild mushrooms are growing out here. So take care of yourselves. Much love everybody. Peace out